Excellent. We good? Good to go? Great. Uh, look, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the first meeting, public meeting of the Yarra Health Forum for a long, long time. And uh, we haven't been in this room for over three and a half years. So I'd also like to thank the uh, City of Yarra for the generous provision of the facility. But most of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're standing on Aboriginal land. It's been Aboriginal land for thousands and thousands of years. It has been the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, a nation with a proud history of culture and language and art and music and politics. It's a land that we stole from those people. And I'd like to acknowledge our stealing of their land today and the ownership of their land that still exists. And uh, every day we see examples of what that stealing and that colonisation has done to that community. We also see amazing examples of how their culture and their life has thrived despite the injustices and the oppression that we have, uh, we have, we have visited upon that community. I'd like to pay my respects to one Colin Hunter, who was a one of the elder, who has worked in this building and in this community for many, many years, and who's no longer employed here, but is uh, still a significant person in this community. So that's me. So my name's Peter Wood, I'm the chairperson of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. My community-based award ends in about 10 years' time, and I'll be able to relinquish the uh, chairmanship of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the Yarra Drug and Health Forum without having to go to jail. But it's been a real privilege to be the chairperson of this organisation. And many of you that are here tonight are known to me, not all, but many of you are, and we appreciate the support the forum has had over many, many years. Um, this is a really important night for us tonight, and in a moment we're going to be introducing our guest speaker, and uh, I was going to say the Honourable Richard Di Natale, but I'm not allowed to say the Honourable. The Honourable, the default Richard Di Natale, um, is going to do, uh, do the honours of introducing our, 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 our guest speaker. But, uh, a quick word, I'd like to introduce our new Executive Officer, and I'm going to embarrass him by making him stand up. So, <laughs> Dr. Stephen McNally, and I will give his full title. Stephen has been a, a, a significant contributor in the world of harm reduction and epidemiology and research in those areas, both nationally in Victoria and internationally for many, many years. And we were so thrilled, in fact, somewhat relieved, that Stephen applied for the job because it was looking pretty dodgy for a while. <laughs> um, and uh, Stephen's uh, began work just before Christmas, and many of you have already met Stephen in his role at the Pennington Institute, and also many of you would have met Stephen by him reaching out to you as he's taken up his role in the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. But we want to formally welcome you, Stephen. So let's give Stephen a call. I'd like to now hand over to Richard Di Natale to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I probably don't need this, do I? G'day, everyone. Um, my name's Richard Di Natale. I'm um, currently a public health advisor at CoHealth. So for those people who don't know CoHealth, it's a not-for-profit community health service. Uh, we have a long and proud history uh, of working with communities. And indeed, uh, we've got a very strong focus on the response to people uh, who use illicit drugs and get into trouble with um, illicit drugs. Uh, it's a great organisation to work for. I'm very proud to work for um, CoHealth. I've seen many of my colleagues uh, in the audience here tonight. Um, when I was asked to introduce Fiona, um, I was really pleased to do it because uh, the truth is that in politics, uh, part of the art of politics is to really highlight differences with people. Part of the job of getting votes is you, you've got to tell people why you're different from the other mob, and maybe even if the differences aren't that great, you, you manufacture them. So that's the business of politics. Um, but the reality is that um, Fiona and her party, myself, the Greens, uh, we're fellow travellers when it comes to how we respond uh, to the issue of the harms associated with drug use, 
Indeed, we fill our trevors, I think, on many, many issues. So it's a, it's a great, it's a great um, uh, honour to be able to introduce Fiona. I should say also, while we're in the business of acknowledgements, um, Amy Pugliari is our uh, Green's new uh, Upper House, newly minted Upper House Member of Parliament, one of the power brokers in the new state parliament, so it's great to have Abe here as well. I don't know, are there any other pollies here that I should be acknowledging? No, great, right. Um, look, I spent, I spent a long time in my job in the federal parliament trying to raise the profile of um, the harms that we're inflicting on people because of the way we respond to illicit drug use. I'm, look, I was a spectacular failure uh, at it. I couldn't get any interest from either of the major parties in it. It was a really hard slog. And, I'm being honest, it, it says a lot more about them than it does about, about me, but it was a really hard slog. Um, it's one of the few areas in public life. So when I started in Parliament, the idea that, a, for example, a same-sex attracted couple could get married felt like it was a lifetime away. When I left Parliament, marriage equality was in law. We made huge strides on issues like racism, sexism, homophobia, <coughs> But one of the few areas in public life where it's still okay to openly discriminate, insult, express stigma and hostility towards our fellow human beings is around illicit drug policy. Uh, and we've got a hell of a long way to go. So it's my um, honour and duty to introduce Fiona. She's going to talk a little bit about the progress that she was able to make in state parliament but I suspect, more importantly, the long road that lies ahead for, for all of us. So over to you, Fiona. Yes, Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. It's, um, it's, quite, it's wonderful to see you all. And um, I have to say, this is kind of like bookending my time in Parliament because um, in 2014, when I was running for election, I, um, yeah, I've found, yeah, uh, I was in this room um, in a pre-election campaign debate. I think John Fain was chairing it, moderating it, um, and we were sitting up there, and that was in 2014, talking about why we needed a supervised injecting room, uh, why we needed to to regulate and um, regulate cannabis, uh, why we needed to change the debate on on drugs, and 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 as um, Richard has just said. You know, we've shifted the dial, but we've still got a long way to go. But I, I would like to probably spend a little bit of time reflecting on some of the things that most of the people in the room travelled with me in getting the reform up. Um, you know, so many of you appeared in Parliament, um, you know, got on the phones, harangued and emailed um, members of Parliament um, for in, in lots of different ways and in, in very successfully. And, um, thank you for that acknowledgement of country, Peter, and thank you for, 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 for being here for such a long time. Welcome, Steve. Um, it's great to see you wearing another hat. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge that we are on Wurundjeri and um, Woiwurrung land of the Kulin Nation um, and acknowledge it was never ceded. And also acknowledge that when we talk about drug policy and when we talk about drug prohibition, when we talk about the harms of drugs, they are always exponentially impacted upon our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. And we see this in, um, in our overdoses, we see it in our statistics at the supervised injecting room, we see it in our court statistics, we see it in our prison statistics, sadly we see it in our overdose and death st statistics, but in every statistic we see the impact not only of colonisation but also of, the ter of our terrible um, and broken drug policies. I, I, it, I, when, I, I, when Stephen was asking me what, what I would call, you know, what I don't want to title this, and I, you know, I quipped eight years in the big house, and then I was thinking, gee, is that really the right term to be using, particularly when I'm talking about drug policy? But um, it has been eight years, and it, 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 I still kind of pinch myself that I was there for eight years. Um, it, it, I, I, look, it was an amazing ride, and I, you know, I 
I have to say that probably in the first, I was thinking about and I've been going back and looking at Hansards today and just looking at things people said and but then I was also re reflecting on things that I had done and, you know, like um, smoking a joint in front of a very conservative politician while on a, um, in, well, on a um, regional tour for a, for a committee inquiry. I didn't realise I was smoking a joint in front of her because I didn't know she was there, but I'll tell <laughs> mention I, I, I may actually name names in a minute. In a minute. Um, taking the Assistant Commissioner, Rick Nugent, to a cannabis cookie factory um, in Colorado. Uh, he, put his, he, he didn't quite realise where he was until he was right in there and wearing the net and wearing all of the booties and everything. He was like, this doesn't seem right. Um, and when we tried to, we, we took him to a whole bunch of cannabis places. I'll talk about that in, uh, in a minute. But um, uh, it, it was, it, it, now reflecting back on it, I just think that was quite remarkable. Um, and it was these amazing opportunities that we had. And I think in many ways, and I'll reflect on this in a minute, that actually those, those some of those things I was able to do and some of those, think those um, policies and those inquiries and those people, those private members bills that I was part of have shifted the dial and have actually made some change. But, but as Richard said, there's certainly a lot more to do. And, you know, when we, I was just, we were just talking about the second supervised injecting room. Um, you know, we nearly thought we were there and then it just keeps getting harder. Like, I have no doubt we will get a, uh, another surprise injection room or overdose prevention centre or um, I think I was just looking at um, John Ryan's report and what did he call it? Um, overdose management and recovery services. Now I think that's that is exactly what we want and that's exactly what we want to be doing so I hope that we will see this go forward but you know still tens of thousands of Victorians are being arrested every day for using drugs using and possessing, not dealing, not trafficking, using and possessing. Um, in fact, out of all drug arrests in Victoria, 93.5% of them are for personal use. 93.5% are for personal use. 80% um, of the offences that go through our courts are drug uh, drug offences are drug possession. So, you know, everyone says, oh, we treat it like a health issue, not a criminal one. Oh, we've got diversion. Well, we don't. We probably have diversion if you are a reasonably uh, fair-skinned, young, middle-class or middle-class person. Yes, we probably have some excellent diversion and, and other strategies for you. But for the rest of people, no, we don't. In fact, <laughs> It is the third most, um, so in our magistrate's court, it is the third most common charge. In our magistrate's court, drug possession is the third most common charge that is heard in that court. Now, you know, we, we, we might talk about some of the solutions and talk about, you know, how to solve the budget. Well, you know, when, the, when you were sending 21,000 people through our magistrate's courts for drug possession, um, that is insane. That is insane. And it has not stopped. As we know, um, in this room in particular, it has not stopped anyone using drugs. And it has not reduced the harm that may be associated with some people using drugs. Our pharmacotherapy. You know, we were leading the world on harm reduction and, and, and how we dealt with methadone. Um, and we really were right out there. And in fact, Victoria was as well. You know, Victoria was like, no, let's, let's let it out in the chemists. But that's changing now, and it is becoming so much harder um, for, me, for people to, to access pharmacotherapy. Um, there's a whole bunch of new pharmacotherapy that we could be providing that we're not. Um, but despite that, I think we still have made some progress. Um, and in my time, I put up um, 12 private members' bills. Uh, I, I got the parliamentary library to check, that is the record, um, for the most private members' bills. So I'm contacting the Guinness Book of Records very soon. Um, it's a very small, narrow classification, uh, but I did, we did do that. Um, and I'd have to say, and it, 
And it was interesting how drug policy just wove its way through many of them. Like, you know, when I think about some of the highlights of those, uh, the work that I did, um, you know, voluntary sister dying obviously was just such an extraordinary, um, a, an extraordinary policy change, and an ex, and in, and for me, just an extraordinary, wonderful journey to have been privileged to go on, having been part of the, having in, initiated the inquiry and then been part of that inquiry, and then, you know, tra spent those seventy two hours. Um, the non-stop debate of it. But even in that inquiry, drug laws came up because the possession of, um, what's the drug, Richard, the, the drug we use for voluntary sister dying? Oh, Nimbutal. Nimbutal. So the possession of Nimbutal and people were being arrested for possession of that. Now they weren't going to sell it. They weren't going to be good. They, they might have used it. In fact, for many of them, it was just having it in the cupboard. So they started talking. So there was even people recommending back then in voluntary assisted dying that we change our drug laws and we changed our possession laws, our possession laws in particular, and we decriminalised um, possession of um, restricted restricted drugs. Um, spent, spent convictions was the other. Um, I think probably one of the other. Um, pieces of legislation that I feel most proud of because that was also something. So, spent con does does everyone know what spent convictions are? Yeah, it's it's so you don't live with if you if you have a criminal record, you don't have to live with it for life. It doesn't become a life sentence. And again, for for Aboriginal and First Nations people, this was this had an extraordinary impact on their lives. And in fact, um, some of our Aboriginal elders. You know, they had charge sheets dating back to when they were two because they had been charged with being a neglected child. It was a criminal offence to be a neglected child back in the 60s. Um, so speak convictions, but also when you looked at speak convictions, um, so much of it was small drug convictions. You know, that young people getting picked up on a small possession charge you know, were, were then, it was changing, it was changing the trajectory of their life because of that conviction that it then restricted their abilities to work, it restricted their abilities to travel, it restricted, it narrowed their future. Um, but it, so in everything that we did, and so then, you know, as people know, in the last four years, I was the chair of the Legal and Social Issues Committee where we undertook inquiries into spare convictions, we undertook inquiries into the justice system, and we undertook an inquiry into the use of cannabis, um, but also the impact on children of parental incarceration. Now, honestly, there was not a single, I don't think there was really, there was not a single inquiry where our drug policies were not raised as, you know, putting people at disadvantage and unnecessarily impacting on people's lives. Um, so it just came through with everything. You know, sadly, in some of those, like the, the Justice Inquiry, which was two volumes, it was a, it really, it was a landmark inquiry. It was quite, um, it was quite an extraordinary inquiry. And um, I just joined um, the board of VACRO, which is a reintegration, um, wonderful reintegration organisation that's been operating in Victoria for 150 years. And they were talking about it. And sadly, the government hasn't responded. They haven't responded to the use of cannabis report. They haven't responded to um, they haven't responded to the impact of parental incarceration either, and it's it's frustrating. And you know, I I don't know what we do because the law is very clear. You know, the Parliament Act says governments must respond, but if they don't, we can't arrest them. Um, despite what some of the people standing outside Parliament were saying during COVID. Um, but we can't arrest them. But when you, when you sort of think back also eight years, so um, the supervised injecting centre, it, it, it's, it it's, it, it's been really interesting looking back at the debate that we had back then in the Parliament. You know, and people were saying things like, you know, Bertie Finn was saying, just shoot them and bring back the death penalty. Um, that, that'll fix them. We'd probably only have to shoot two or three and that'd send a message. Uh, 
Yeah, and we laugh. I mean, we because it's so ridiculous. But those were the types of comments that were being made back then. You know, um, Inga Paulich was just calling us all a bunch of wimps. You know, saying, "Well, you think this is a war on drugs? You think this is a war? You haven't seen a war." You know, I've seen a war, and she's she has many war stories to tell you how she climbed over communist babies to get to the free lands of Australia. And um, she was actually also the person I smoked the joint with. Um, <laughs> okay, she didn't have any. <laughs> she had a big glass of whiskey and a fag. Um, <laughs> but I was just walking past her room and she sort of stopped me. She thought I was smoking a cigarette. And she was like, oh, hey, how, you know, how are you? Oh, do you want to join me for a drink? And I'm like, I uh, know, but um, anyway, would you like some of this? And she was like, uh, and, oh, well, back in the day, um, you know, I inhaled, but yeah, not anymore. Um, but, you know, and you had people like Bill Tilly, who also, big smoker, big drinker, you know, making jokes around, what was he calling it? I was having a look at it today. Um, oh, calling the supervised injecting room McSmacks. <laughs> You know, and so that, you know, you'd, um, what's he saying, Carl Swastow, you, you'd meet your dealer in the car park before heading inside McSmacks to minimise the harm you do to yourself. Got that bit wrong. Um, whilst mummy gets high, the kids play in the adjacent playroom or watch Smacky McSmackface, the heroin clown, making animals out of discarded heroin balloons. Um, anyway, they, this was the type of appalling type of debate that we were hearing back then. Um, now, as you all know, last week, we, the supervised injecting room, the permanency of the supervised injecting room is being legislated. And it was being, and it was being debated last week in the parliament. Very different conversation. Very different. You know, you've got liberal members saying, oh, we support these rooms. I mean, they're wonderful. Wonderful things, save lives, brilliant. I mean, not in Richmond, of course. Um, I mean, they didn't support the bill, but they did um, speak about the support of it. They've even, and they've got policies around hydromorphone, like injectable um, pharmacotherapy. You know, they said, <laughs> why aren't we giving people analogues of heroin? Um, these are the types of policies that have, have happened in the last six years. And I think, you know, I'm looking at um, Sam here from VADA because also they're quoting VADA um, quite a lot. In fact, they're quoting a lot of you in this room um, in, their, in their contributions. So we are making an impact and we are making a difference. All right, we haven't got them over the line to support the legislation, but we have got them over the line um, in supporting the notion of this form of harm reduction and this form of harm minimization. Um, so it is going somewhere. You know, more recently I've been involved because I'm helping out the legalised cannabis um, MPs uh, settle in and kind of hit the ground running. And so we, got a, we did a private members bill for medicinal cannabis and driving. Because as many of you know, um, you know if, you, if you are a patient, if you are prescribed with medicinal cannabis and you're pulled over on a roadside drug test, um, it doesn't test for impairment, obviously it'll test for presence and um, you will lose your licence. So basically, if you are a medicinal cannabis patient, you are prohibited from driving um, effectively. And this is not because you're impaired. And, and these, these are people who have um, who are, who have taken themselves off benzodiazepines, who have taken themselves off strong opioid medications um, because they're finding the lightness of, of medicinal cannabis um, helps them with their pain, helps them with their sleep, helps them with um, their tremors or whatever it might be, but at what cost? And the cost is being able to get out and about. So all of a sudden they're feeling you know, well enough to get out and about, but they can't drive. Um, now, back when I first introduced that, that bill a, few, a number of years ago, you know, there was people saying, well, you know, They'll just go and get a prescription from the doctor and then they'll be having bongs for breakfast. I mean, we won't know if it's medicinal cannabis in their system or it's just regular cannabis in their system. Um, I don't want to break it to them that there is no difference, uh, really. But, um, and, but this was the kind of a attitude that we, we got back then. Um, and the government also, we had a working group, we had a task force, we looked at this. Um, 
the police were saying, well, you know, I don't want to be the person that, you know, lets someone drive off when they've tested positive and goes and, you know, has an accident. Never this, never this conversation about benzodiazepines. Never this conversation about opioids. Never this conversation about any other impairing medication of which we prescribe tens of thousands, of which we know that our overdose rates in Victoria, which as we know exceed, far exceed our, our deaths on the road, we know that most of those deaths are from prescription drugs. They're not from illicit drugs and they're certainly not from cannabis. But it has changed. And, you know, in the debate that happened a couple of weeks ago, the Premier says, we've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. In fact, we're going to do something. We're going to have a trial in the coming months. Now, um, the coming months are fast coming. Um, I, you know, I think coming months, like, that's not a year. That's, um, I, you know, he said that in the beginning of March. I reckon July is the coming months. So um, we're meeting with the Minister for Road Safety next week to, um, to work out how she's going to do this by 1 July. Um, but we'll see. But, but it was really different. And even the opposition were saying, we understand this. We understand this. And they, they understood that, you know, that, that this was unfair and they could get this. So we've, near, we've made significant progress in that area. Um, Decriminalisation or diversion or whatever we want to call it. I mean, I think, I think many of us in the room, we sort of have to come up with a better word than decrim. It, it's, 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 it's just, it's a word that can, it, it's like pornography. I mean, it just means something different to everyone. You know, um, you know for some members, as you know, I used to be a lobbyist for the porn industry, so... Um, you know, I would deal with some people who thought Dolly Magazine, if it had a sealed section, was pornography. Um, and other people, well, you know, whatever your peccadillo is. But, uh, you know, we decriminalised sex work in the last term. And, you know, something obviously I was really proud of. But the decriminalised... If you look at the legislation that decriminalises sex work, and then you look at what we're talking about when we're talking about not arresting people for possession and use, it's a very different piece of legislation. The decriminalisation of sex work really was repealing the Sex Work Act and, and, and putting protections for sex workers into existing regulations so that they were treated, so sex workers were treated as any other worker and sex work businesses were treated as any other business. Now, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about the decriminalisation of, of use and possession of drugs. So I do think it's something for the future that we need to think about. So when we tried to put up a bill um, a few years ago, we, we tried to talk about diversion and it being, you know, keeping the penalties for the use and possession, um, but having a compulsory diversion for, for absolutely everyone. Uh, that, that went on to... Um, they, the government then agreed to not support that. And, and again, you know, back then, you know, we had Bernie Finn screeching, you know, after he'd had a few bottles of Prosecco and maybe a cigar, just kill him. You know, um, they're doing it to themselves. Or just say no. Like, why can't people just not dr take drugs? You know, damn it. Um, where's my beer? <laughs> uh, but I, I think that will change. And you know, we were just talking before this about um, you know, the cost of it not changing. When we look at our prison systems, for example, when we look at the cost of imprisoning someone, and when we look at you know, probably close to 60 or 70% of the people in, in prison um, have, a, have an issue with drug use, um, or a mental health issue, or probably both. Um, so when we look at how we could introduce policies and laws that could, you know, change the trajectory of those people, then we would save billions of dollars um, there. But we may see this, and then we've seen Queensland, I mean, for God's sake, Queensland has gone down this path. Queensland also going down the path of pill testing and drug checking. Um, you know, 
who ever thought that we'd be saying, could Victoria be a bit more like Queensland? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, apart from the weather, obviously. But, um, you know, this is kind of, you know, upside down world, really. Um, but I do think that this will change. And again, you know, as I said, in the justice report um, and in the use of cannabis report, in the justice report, there was not a, I don't think we had a single, um, or, well, every peak legal organisation that put a submission into that um, inquiry recommended drug law reform and recognised the impact of our drug laws on our criminal justice system. Every single one. Um, even the police. Not enough to recommend change, but the police acknowledged it. And we've seen the police acknowledge it in their drug strategy. And I think this also, so their drug strategy um, in 2022 to 2025, um, it's quite a marked difference. Like, okay, you know, you can't, I'm kind of like scrambling for something, you know, to find good things. But in actual fact, um, Commissioner Rick Nugent, who, who authored that, that strategy, um, suggested four pillars of, of harm reduction. So harm, or yeah, harm minimisation, harm reduction, <coughs> harm reduction, um, the three plus treatment um, that we've got now. We've so seen that them actively saying, we don't, we don't want to be arresting people for using drugs. We want to find another option. You know, we want to be focusing our limited resources on what will work and what will change, what could change things. And I think that had a lot to do with Rick Nugent coming with us on that tour. So when we went on our, you know, our, dr our drug tour, um, that, that was how the media um, ran it. And in fact, like, we went to Portugal, we went to Switzerland, we went to, we went to Colorado, we went to, um, went to Canada, um, and then we popped down to California uh, to see they were just legalising cannabis at the time, and we were just um, we were just seeing we were, so we were seeing how they were going to roll it out. Um, and in fact, I was in, on a teleconference with Colorado this morning, um, and their cannabis industry in Colorado is the same about the same population as Victoria. Their, their cannabis industry is now worth three billion dollars. Um, they hypothecate their taxes, so that means that any tax made from those, um, fr from those businesses and from the cannabis industry is used for certain purposes of education. So now in Colorado, you can have free university education funded by cannabis. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's quite remarkable and it just shows you what we can do. You know, Germany's about to change. And that's going to be a game changer for the EU. So once once Germany comes on board, we will see things we will see things that are really going to change. Um, you know, look at the UN. They just what was it? Just last month, we've seen the UN um, really change their, po their their policy. Really start talking about not this drug free world. This you know. Re um, completely unrealistic um, policies and conventions that they've had for decades, now starting to talk about um, other policies and a human and, and you know, structuring UN, UN drug conventions in a human rights structure. Um, you know, it, and uh, I was hearing, I mean, it's the first time, because they usually try and get consensus, but because everyone's so pissed off with Russia at the moment, um, <laughs> Like really pissed off with them. So all the guys who used to just, you know, kind of go, oh no, let's not, let's not let Russia get angry. Let's just be nice and play consensus. They didn't this time. And in fact, the, for the first time, um, our dr drug policy got taken to a vote of which 124 members voted in favour of a human rights um, and harm reduction approach um, and only nine voted against it. Um, so things are changing, uh, and so yeah, the idea that we're the idea that we're still fighting for a drug-free Victoria, um, you know, we're quite, you know, we're going to be standing there with Russia. Um, <laughs>
I know, yeah. Thailand, exactly. Mexico, you know. I mean, and then you had the, I don't think it was Mexico, it might have been Colombia or Bolivia, was also calling for the cocoa leaf to be um, uh, descheduled by the UN. <laughs> So we're, we're seeing all of these changes. So I, I think these are really good. It's really good, but it's important work for us. We're seeing, look at the psychedelics, where we're moving, you know, and I mean, the TGA was, was quite a remarkable decision by the TGA, and I think it surprised everyone when the TGA um, actually did uh, down schedule um, psychedelics for, 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 clinical, for clinical use. Um, we're all still a bit surprised by it. Uh, and, and, ha and how it's going to look. But the FDA is also just about to approve MDMA, um, particularly for PTSD. So we're seeing these changes, and I think, you know, Victoria can be part of this, and I'm still confident that we can go, da we can go down this path. I think, look, you know, particularly when you look at the, the upper house at the moment, with, um, with the Greens in there, with the two legalised cannabis MPs in there, um, with the freedom fighters, of da you know, the, the LDP in there, um, you know, there, there is room to negotiate on these, these issues. And I think if we can start these, these arguments also around not so much, like, you know, it, 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 just was in this conversation with Colorado, they were saying, think of the taxes, think of the taxes. Now, at a state level, we can't really talk about the taxes um, because, you know, we, we can't, we, the states aren't. The states are excluded, really, from um, from uh, from excises or taxes, and from implementing excises or taxes. So it's not it's not a conversation we can have here. But think of the cost savings that we could have. Think of the multi billions of dollars that we could save from not putting people through our magistrates' courts and through our prisons. Now, I know I'm saying this to people who already know this, um, but it's, you know, when we've got Tim Power saying it's going to be a tough budget, um, and, you know, <coughs> I've, got a, I've got a cartoon of myself and Tim Pallas, um sitting on a sofa, um, and, and I'm passing him a giant bomb. Um, and, and it's a bit like, and at the same time, you remember that there was a photo of Grace Tame with a giant bomb, and she said, "Oh, it's my oboe." And, um, and anyway, it was like, here, here's the way to fix the here's the way to fix the budget, treasurer. Um, but I do think these are some of the things that we're going to have to do. Um, you know, looking at what happened last week with the God, it's not last week, it's this week with the Liberal Party. Um, you know, where, again, they, I mean, they, they nearly rolled their, their new leader, their, their freshly minted leader who's going to take them on a new, more collaborative, more kind way forward. Um, and there they are still defending so a trans, someone who gets up and says the most awful things about trans people, says the most awful things about sex workers as well, says the most awful things about a lot of people. Um, and she was um, eventually defended. So the Liberal Party's got to stop eating itself, and we could, you know, and to to see because we need an opposition that can come together on drug law reform. We know where we've seen good drug law reform happen, particularly in places like Portugal. It was bipartisan, um, and that's what we've got to see here. We're seeing it in Malta as well, and I just I'm heading back there um, in, in June. You know, Malta. It like, you know, Malta is introducing some really interesting work on here, which is not commercialising the cannabis industry, but is recognising the harms <coughs> of, the pro of the prohibition on cannabis. So they're setting up legal, so licensed social clubs. And this is some really interesting ways and ways that Victoria could go that would save our state billions and billions of dollars. Um, we've just seen the, the, the John Ryan well, we haven't actually seen the John Ryan review. We've seen 26 pages of the John Ryan review. Um, but in that, he also recommends that the government focuses on drug policy and focuses on it as an interdepartmental um, position. So he's, he's made a recommendation, or that they've made a recommendation um, around a chief addiction medicine advisor, which I think is a really terrific idea. Um, or, and establishing a sort of an addiction medicinal advisory council 
again, really great idea because when you look at when you looked at our Royal Commission into Mental Health in Victoria, another I mean, landmark body of work. Um, but as as you guys know in the room, you know, drug use and drug policy um, and alcohol and other drugs has really just been such a poor cousin in in the rollout of this, and we need that to change. We really need that to change. You know, we have a senior psychiatrist up there, but why don't we have a senior addiction specialist? And in fact, in that drug law reform report that we made back in 2017, we also recommended that there be an advisory council on drug policy and that there be a, ministeri a ministerial council on drug policy. And I think right now, when you think of the psychedelics, you know, the, the, the frightening thought of fentanyl still, and that, you know, it's still very likely to come our way. The growing overdose deaths in our community, the growing prison population because of drugs, then I think it makes sense for us, for the government, to do this. The government did this back in the 1990s. Um, Brax had, had a council, um, so did Jeff Kennett. Um, uh, Daniel Andrews introduced an, an ICE, uh, an, an ICE um, task force that, that sat in Premier and Cabinet. Um, that didn't actually achieve much except for introducing some more draconian legislation um, around, I think it was, you know, the drug, uh, 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 drug de you know, drug, drug dealing um, around schools, I think was about the only thing that came out of that. And they increased the penalties so that we could, um, you know, we could really jail those 18 year olds who were, you know, sharing, sharing their pings or sharing their, their, their pills um, with their with their schoolmates or maybe with their brothers and sisters. Anyway, as you can see, I'm, I'm still passionate about this. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Um, I'm, the the Parliament's probably getting a bit annoyed with me because I'm there a lot. Um, two reasons: one, I have an electric car and they've got a charger, um, <laughs> which is very convenient. Um, and but two, as I say, I'm working with the legalised cannabis MPs and obviously. They're passionate about drug law reform, they're passionate about the regulation of cannabis, but they're also passionate about drug law reform on the bigger picture. They, they understand that, and so I would hope that we will see, be seeing them pushing the government um, towards steps around, particularly around possession and use. Um, I think, you know, in light also of, and I'll finish now, in light also of the Veronica Nelson um, inquest, um, in light of so many fucking inquests and reports that we will see a change in that drug policy. Um, you know, forever the optimist, forever the optimist, but you know, right now there's a, there's a, it's an interesting upper house, um, and there's, 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 you know, the shift, the, the, the community has shifted, we know, and the community is always ahead of the politicians. Um, so we know the community supports the regulation of cannabis. We know the community supports the decriminalisation of the use and possession of drugs. Um, so now we've just got to get the parliament to do it. Um, and I know that for many of you who work in this sector in this room, this will make your job a whole bunch easier. Um, you, it will make your clients' lives a whole bunch easier. Um, and it will make our community a whole bunch nicer. Um, but yeah, so I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do keep hanging around Parliament um, and I will think about what my next job will be. Um, so I'm looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, not really. I'm kind of too busy to be looking for a job. I've been um, um, having too much fun. But um, thank you again for having me and thank you all for just all the work that you've done and, and for all the the support and assistance you have provided me over the last eight years, um, what we were able to achieve in that eight years was largely um, on your shoulders. So thank you. I was just wondering, when you talk about this, like, we do a perceptual discourse changing over time, 
do you think that decriminalisation of cannabis is a necessary step on the way to like, like legalisation? And I don't know if you know this, but in Iceland, all the bottle shops or places you can get alcohol from like, that aren't licensed venues are owned and operated by the government. Do you think that's something that's more likely to happen in general, like, like recreation? Yeah. It, it's such a good question, and and it's so interesting because you look at like you look at Uruguay. So when Uruguay legalised cannabis, they it was very it was government owned the whole way from seed to sale, um, and it was sold through government businesses. They've now deregulated that a little bit and licensed it. Um, some provinces in Canada. Uh, had similar um, uh, bottle shop, sim similar alcohol regu regulations to Iceland, where the, um, the the sale of alcohol is run by the government and owned by the and the bottle shops are owned by the government, and then they license them out. And th those provinces are doing the same with cannabis. Now, whether we go cannabis decriminalisation, regulation, taxation, I don't know. And in, it, because I was speaking to Colorado this morning. And I was speaking to a fellow who has been part of about 10 of the campaigns to legalise cannabis in states in, in the states in the states. Um, he was saying where they get the most success in regulating cannabis for adult use um, is where there has been a very broad medicinal cannabis um, industry. So he reminded me that in Colorado, um, before they legalised and regulated adult use cannabis in 2012, um, that, in two, that in 2012 there were 600 um, medicinal cannabis uh, dispensaries there. Uh, so that, that was kind of um, how the, the, their, their ship towards regulation um, flowed, and that seems to be what we've seen in most of the US and certainly even in Canada, like it, it kind of slipped, it kind of came through a, a, a you know, as, as medicinal cannabis became more and more relaxed as the regulations there. So we might go a different way. And I think, you know, European <coughs> countries are probably going more um, towards the decriminalisation than to a regulated market. Um, I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling that, um, well... Yeah, I, I have a feeling that where our medicinal cannabis in market is taking us, um, that that may be a path. That's a, that's a pathway as well. So you might call that medicinal cannabis in Trump. You might. You might. In fact, that was in my notes. It was in my notes, but I didn't say that. Good on you. And I was going to say, it is a gateway drug, but it's a gateway drug for good things. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I believe so. And, and I think now that more, when there was a study done, I can't remember who did it, either University of New South Wales or the Lambert Institute, where they surveyed thousands of cannabis users about why they used cannabis. And two, over two thirds of them um, used it for medicinal purposes. Yeah. And this was just, this was not people with a prescription. Nico. Thanks, Diana. <coughs> I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the way decisions are made in our fund, <laughs> and and just in the and within mind, you know, with all this discussion about the voice, the importance of having the voice of people that these decisions affect, and it seems sometimes that people are making decisions on drug uh, laws and, and don't have easy access to the people that these decisions affect and they may not understand all those issues from that perspective, whether it's the person using drugs, their family member. Um, any, so any yeah, reflections on, on mm. a little bit of the mystery of how, how this is made and perhaps is there a way that we can do more mm. in that, you know, as we're trying with the voice to include the easier access to the decision makers to some of those stories? Um, I, I... I, I don't have an, have an answer, Nico, but it's a really good, it's a really good question. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree with you. But, and it's interesting that sometimes it is, it is so often, it is those personal stories that change the course. And, you know, when I think back to medicinal cannabis, 
you know, we were probably the only jurisdiction, we were the first jurisdiction in, in Australia to legalise medicinal cannabis, but we were probably the only jurisdiction in the world that only legalised it for children. Um, you know, the, was, and this was because of an interaction that the Premier had with a young boy who had intractable epilepsy. Uh, I think when we, were do, when we were campaigning for the supervised injecting room, the voices of the families and Judy Ryan's campaign um, in the, you know, the streets for the residents of uh, residents of, of, of Richmond, but certainly the, the voices of Cherie Short, the, um, the the voices of those families, uh, was incredibly impactful. In assisted dying, again, the voices, the stories of lived experience were very impactful and we need to do more of that and it's hard and I think for, for many of us we actually have to come out about our drug use you know when uh, Rich was talking about um, marriage equality and when we you know, it, you know from, many of us remember even just the well Rich in particular will remember the stigma around HIV and AIDS and the sick, and that you know, people were still in the closet back in the 80s and 90s around being gay because of the stigma and discrimination of being gay, <coughs> let alone when HIV came up. And so you were not only you know, gay, but you were possibly infected with this ghastly um, uh, disease. Uh, so I wonder if we need to start, we need to be telling our own personal stories and we need to be talking more. Now that's hard because you people work. And it's hard because um, you know it, it can impact on you. But I do think maybe we need to t tell our stories and we need to be out and loud about our experiences. And we know that's hard. And we know that in that campaign with Supervised Injection Room, how many parents talked about how they didn't want to talk about their loved one dying of an overdose. They would tell their, they would tell their friends that they died in a car accident. Um, and they, because of the shame and the stigma, and, and that, that's what we've got to change. And that, and but those stories are so impactful, and you know the number of times you hear members of parliament, um, they you know they love to be able to quote someone. You know, I got an email from Lisa, and she told me this story, and um, and members of parliament from all sides are not you know are not immune to that and they are impacted by it so i think that's one way i, I would also love to see um some form of citizens jury maybe on drug policy in victoria and i know new south wales the new south uh, premier mins uh chris mins has committed to a, a drug policy summit um in new south wales i i would suggest that that might be something we should be campaigning to do here in Victoria, uh, but maybe do it as as a um, a citizens jury uh, and run it that in that way. Yeah, that's right. A councillor Amanda Stone, who's a councillor in yes. the city of Yarra, that's one of the areas of uh, work that she's undertaken. Apart from being a strong environmentalist and sustainability advocate, she's talked a lot about the devolution of power making, mm -hmm. of decision making, and power sharing at a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Amanda, as an apology tonight, she's unwell, she would have loved to have been here. Next question. Yes, over here. Hi, uh, my name's Pat, I'm from um, Shark, a frequency, did you have a frequency officer? I um, And you mentioned about um, AMD being like the poor cousin in terms of health reform. And you know, that's really our experience with fighting to have to get our consumer voices to be heard mm -hmm. in a lot of the mental health reform consultation that's going on at the moment. And you also mentioned like about a addiction advisory board. Like what do you see in the future, like when where AOD will sit being that you kind of feel like this unwelcome part of <laughs> AOD, I mean of mental health. Like, you still have to go, hey, yeah. Um, and it include us. Um, but it's sort of a bit of pushback. It's um it, yeah, it's 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 so interesting how how um, AOD policy sits so uncomfortably wherever it is in government. You know, even though you know most of the 
um, AOD legislation sits in the Justice Department. Um, AOD policy sits in mental health. Um, and, you know, and then we've had times when the AOD, uh, when the you know, the portfolio of AOD actually set with the health minister, not the mental health minister. Um, so we get moved around and we don't sit, and it doesn't sit comfortably anywhere. No. And which is why I think something like a, you know, interdepartmental council or uh, some peak uh, government body that, that has justice in the room, that has mental health in the room, that has health in the room, um, could, has and corrections in the room. <laughs> yeah. And of course, has people with lived experience um, in the room, uh, and so, uh, which is why I'm advocating for this. And I, I just, you know, as an example, with the medicinal cannabis um, and driving legislation. Now, it's a road safety bill because it's trying to treat medicinal cannabis patients like any other patient. So, if you're <coughs> driving and you get pulled over with, you know, you get you test positive. Well, you're, you're pulled over and you're found to be um, impaired by opioids, uh, there's a medical defence for that, that you were taking your medication as prescribed and you just were drowsy or you were wheeling all over the road. And we were just trying to say the medicinal cannabis should be the same. So it's a road safety bill. But of course, you know, when the bill was being debated, the police minister had point on it, had lead on it. And now that we're kind of in this conversation now about about it, um, we got the health minister because obviously this is relevant to prescribers. So we got the health minister, the police minister, the road safety minister, and the attorney general, all now with an interest in that piece of legislation. And AOD is the same. Um, you know, it really is the same. You know, you've got the consumer affairs minister who's in charge of alcohol. Um, and so, yeah, we never, we never sit comfortably, which is why we, we, we're just the, yeah, we're kind of the orphan out there because, you know, it, 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 probably, it probably, as I say this, it's probably actually a really good reason why we should have an AOD minister, um, you know, it, it, and rather than it kind of hanging on somebody else's portfolio. You talk about drug and alcohol as a health issue. Why don't we see it as human rights issue? What business is it of anyone's what I put into my body if I don't harm anyone else? Absolutely, Peter, and, and it is a human rights issue, and I think this is what we just heard from the UN, that it is a human rights issue. Um, and we also heard this, and it was very interesting in the Veronica Nelson inquest, which I know most of you would have watched um, a, a lot of, um, is just horrific as it was, um, that the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, I don't know the legal term, but she, the, the Human Rights Commission, Commissioner, they became uh, uh, involved in that inquest because they thought there was a breach of human rights in there. And they also, the right to health, um, that there was a conversation as to whether drug use um, sat within that that, that protected attribute under our human rights charter. Um, so there, there's actually, I think there's a very sensible argument here, and I, and it's, and I think we're, we're starting to see it articulated, uh, and we're starting to see interest from, so the Human Rights Commissioner, Ro Allen, they are, they are quite interested um, in how the human rights charter may actually be a vehicle to be used to protect um, though those of us who might use alcohol and other drugs. So it's an interesting thing. But I mean, of course, you know, the next job, one of the tasks is to give that charter some teeth. Um, it's all very well having a lovely charter, but um, because it actually can't do much, um, you know, the, but uh, it's actually, I think it's actually coming up for, a the charter's coming up for a review. So that will be another opportunity for us to articulate and uh, articulate this argument. Yeah. Questions? Great. And then you one. Just wanted to know about <coughs> the use of the one, Do you want to announce who you are? Yeah, Greg Hunter from Hobart. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know a bit about what you said before when you spoke about um, your role now. Um, 
But I wanted to know about the future of the Reason Party mm. and where you see it going to in the future. Yeah. And what and what what you see what you see yeah, yeah. is to come. Thanks, Greg. I we're still working through that. Um, the you know the last four years, well, the last eight years, having an elected having an elected member um, certainly assists you in building a party, and um, so not having an elected member um, does does make it more difficult. But we've still got you know thousands of members around around Australia who still support the the aims and, and objectives of the party. Um, so we just just. This up, no, no, Friday, we're handing over the keys to our reason office back to the landlord. So we moved out of our office um, and uh, we were busy moving rubbish this week. So, but I think, you know, it, it, we will build up again. We will run in local government, um, we'll run local government campaigns again uh, and we'll, we'll be gearing up to run in, at the state election again. I think there still is room for the reason party, you know, when you think of where we were born from, um, so, you know, well, well, sometimes I kind of, you know, look at the, the cannabis party, and, and I can say this because they're my friends, but I, I look at them and go, oh, for fuck's sake, but you put a cannabis leaf on a ballot <laughs> and you get every single voter under 25. Well, you don't get every single, but they got 13% in Cessna in the New South Wales election. Like, they're ph phenomenal, and they, actually they didn't, they just said the name on the ballot there, they didn't even have the, the leaf. Um, but here in Victoria, but I ran as a sex party, so you know I can't be too you know, <laughs> funny about that. But um, yeah, we we we'll, we we think I, I believe there's a there's a future for reason, and I think there's you know we we did achieve just as a single member, we were able to change policy and affect change in this state um, at, at a you know you know, it's a, a good a good amount. Um, so I do think that we can. There's, we've we've set ourselves a, a base, then we can continue to grow from that. So yeah, watch this space. As, as you, you know, as a, as a communications expert, there, there's different stories for different audiences, and and I think that that economic that 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 economic story um, works for some audiences uh, and, and and doesn't for others. But I, I do think what is you know rather than talking about how you know how we might regulate the diversion systems, you know the the story of the young man who, you know, um, was, you know, it is, is crying out for help and is couch surfing and gets picked up using, you know, using a, a illicit drug in a park. Now, rather than arresting and charging and sending that person into a magistrate that will then just further that person's life, if we tell that story of that person who is couch surfing, and, it, and what diversion could have meant, that it would have meant that, that, that just that, that intervention in that person's life at a time before things got really awful for that person, that, that short intervention and, you know, could, could change the tra trajectory of that, that person's life. And, and so there's a positive element that comes out of, 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 a, diversion, of a diversion intervention. I guess, yeah, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And I think when we talk about, you know, spending money on homes, not, not prisons, um, you know, that, that is a 
that is that is a very human story. But you know, when we talk about that, it cost us nearly half a million dollars to keep a woman in prison, um, and she's there not because she committed a violent crime. She's there because she's, um, you know, she's a victim in 90% of the cases. Um, that that she's a victim and that we could spend, you know, there is an economic story to say at $400,000 or $450,000 or a half a million dollars to keep that person in prison for a year and you know, then send their children into out-of-home care and, you know, all of the other costs of what that is. There is a, the human story is probably the, the strongest story for me and, and I think the human story is strong for those in the community when they, they see that person as a human being. But, you know, it, but then you can also say, but we're spending $450,000 doing, punishing this person who is a victim herself, punishing her children, um, and changing the trajectory of probably her whole family's life um, at great expense to us. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I do think the human stories do um, when, and I know that um, Co-Health's been doing quite a bit of work with this around, you know, in some of the, the debate, the um, communications around the CBD and, and, and injecting in the CBD. And I think those break through and I think those, those personal stories, we know they worked in Richmond as well. You know, when, when you've got parents talking about um, the loss of a child or you've got sisters talking about the loss of a sister um, or a brother, they, they, that, it, yeah, providing that face to the law helps. Last couple of questions. Yep, down here and then Sam. Yeah, I'm Adam, just in work with the Australian Society Governance Society. Okay. And I wanted to ask what you feel the impact on job policy of the scheduling of NGMX or the scheduling of NGMX. I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, it, I think it's quite extraordinary, the de You know, I, I, and I think it's, it's terrific and it's fantastic and you know and some of the leading research in psychedelics is is happening right here in Victoria and in Melbourne um, around the health aspect of it now whether that's that's going to mean a, 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 a quickened route to adult use or um, non-therapeutic use of, of psychedelics and MDMA I don't know um, I do think that it, it, it further uh, you know this idea that all drugs are dangerous. I think it further it 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 further chips away at at that argument by saying that in certain circumstances it's actually quite safe. <laughs> um, so I think we chip away we chip away at the arguments um, around the safety of a drug through the the down scheduling of them and through the the wider clinical use of them. Um, but it, it will have to, it will be a more general, it will be a more general policy around not punishing people for using, for, for putting something in their system um, and not punishing them and from a human, maybe from a human rights perspective um, that, that we'll see the changes to MDMA and psilocybin. How, but it certainly does not hurt when the FDA is about to approve MDMA. You know, like when when you've got the FDA involved in something, then that that does, you know, the rest of the world does listen, and the TGA kind of jumping ahead of that with um, with with both psilocybin and MDMA is um, is a very good sign. Well, actually, I have a Hi, Sam. Sam from uh, Victoria Alcohol and Drug Association. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for all the extremely good work you've done over the years and this leadership and the collaboration you've shown in engaging with, with this across the community. Uh, the question I've got is around, uh, given you're a recent insider in the political world, uh, what is it that's actually driving it? When, when it looked like a lot of the pieces had been put in place for there to be a much more progressive um, dealing with these issues, uh, why is it that the prison system expanded? Why is it the alcohol and drug issue 
has gone into a much more harmful way with alcohol and much more repressive controlling, uh, it seems like a lot more control over the, the drug issue. Uh, with what looked like there was going to be a second facility, and there may still be, I don't know. Um, and is it because we, you can't achieve some of these things in a country where there's a Murdoch press? Or is it that there's a fear, given the majority that they've got, given that the fear that they may lose a government, uh, what's your inside of view of what's going on? Yeah, I, I've, I've never been, well, I, I mean, I've never been a member of a political party except for one I founded. But um, it seems to me that in the Labor Party, you know, it's, <laughs> there's people at both ends of the spectrum in there. So you've got very progressive people, but you've also got incredibly conservative people. People who, you know, would sit with Bernie Finn very easily. Um, and so I think that makes caucuses very difficult on these policies. Uh, I think the police have been particularly powerful um, and I think unrepresented, you know, and I think the Police Association in particular has been very powerful um, and I would suggest quite, quite often unrepresentative of their members um, in this area. We all know, you know, we've all spoken to police who really would like, who would like to be in this room and would be agreeing with us. Um, so, I, so I, you know, I don't know when the last police strike was, and I, you know, and did it bring down a government? Like, it did almost, yeah. yeah. So, you know, obviously still in, you know, recent history for some members of parliament. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's also this argument that they can only do so many things. Like, they can't, you know, like, it, even though in New South Wales they said, well, we can't legalise abortion and voluntary assisted dying in the same term. You know, that's just too much. They did. <laughs> you know? Um, so there's, there's, uh, there, there is that argument as well, I hear. So I hear that they want to change bail reform, they want to do bail reform, they want to raise the age, they want to do some very good reform. Um, but then they go, but then we can't do this as well. So, so, yeah, I, I can't make sense of it, Sam. Um, but I do, um, it, you know, given, the, given the, up, the way the upper house has been for the last, well, two terms and now a third term, uh, with more and more independence in there and, and a diversity of independence, um, it's, 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 it's harder for, for governments to, to push their, to, to, to trap, to, to be lone travellers and to to, um, to to not listen to to others. So I I think we there's still opportunities for us, and you know bail reform will have a significant impact on our just on our correction system. <laughs> so Nick, you are um, the last question. So I, look, it's a side issue to what we've been talking about tonight, but it, it pretty much happened over the entirety of your term in Parliament. Would you like to comment on the vape issue? Ah, oh, yes, Nick. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'm an advocate, advocate for, for vaping, and I, I find it just extraordinary um, that, you know, even, well, there's a, there's a few outsiders that would argue that they are as dangerous as cigarettes, but very few out, very few people will argue that. Most people will recognise that they are, in fact, less harmful than putting, it, inhaling um, combustible tobacco. Uh, and, and in Australia, you know, we understand harm reduction, we understand harm minimisation, we understand this through needle exchanges back in, you know, the 80s. Um, but we don't seem to understand it with tobacco. And, you know, because tobacco is, um, is so evil and the industry has been so evil, like even more evil than Monsanto with napalm, um, it, it's so evil. And uh, Bloomberg has put billions of dollars into this. I mean, Bloomberg funds the Heart Foundation and the Lung Foundation 
almost solely in the US now. Um, and, and that funding is also finding itself into, into Australia. So I'm perplexed and disappointed by the fact that even, you know, even, even though everyone says, no, it would be better if, you know, if, if we can get people off smoking, and we know, and we're seeing it in New Zealand, we're seeing it in the UK, we're seeing it in the US, we're seeing it around the world, that um, this is assisting people um, to not smoke. It's not maybe assist, it's not it's not stopping them it's not stopping their nicotine addiction, but it's providing them with a slightly safer way. You know, as someone was saying, it's like the methadone. Um, it's like methadone for, for for nicotine or for tobacco. Um, and I I you know I, I would love to see us do something sensible. Uh, you know I, you know it's it's terrible when you're agreeing with you know Angus Taylor or someone from the Nats. So. And you, so where they're saying, can we just regulate it like an adult product? Um, and we, you know, we've been pushing for this for years. I mean, I, I was pushing back in the the, eight, the 90s that the tobacco should be sold from age-restricted venues. And I can tell you, the Cancer Council was appalled at that idea at the time. Oh, well, no, that would be far, going far too far. Um, so, you know, but, but requiring someone to get a prescription and requiring a doctor to prescribe something that the person is going to buy from an online website in another country. Like, it's not, you know... 500 meters you can buy tobacco. So, like, how does that... Even if a doctor wants to prescribe, they... I, I mean, I've got a prescription, uh, and, um, you yeah, know, and I've been... But it, it, you know, I hardly use it now, but I, I've got a, prescri got a prescription, and it really helped me give up smoking. Um, but my prescription is, like you know, can buy capsule, you know, pods, this many pods per month for six months. Um, but, you know, and what customs is, this is, and this is just to show customs if, if, if it gets stopped. Like, it's, it's weird, you know. What other thing do we prescribe in that way? Um, so I, I would hope that there could be some rational debate about this. Um, I, you know, the, you know, we know that <laughs> the more that we don't do this, the more that we allow people to smoke, the better that is for the tobacco industry. You know, but somehow we don't allow vaping because of the tobacco industry. I'm going to, uh, <laughs> on, on that note, I'm going to uh, conclude your part, but I'd just like us to acknowledge uh, Fiona's contribution tonight. Yeah. <laughs> So Fiona, I, I want to say as chair of the forum that Fiona's always said yes to our invitations to come and speak, even when there were like uh, two people in an old footy pavilion <laughs> at uh, Ember Gardens about 12 months ago or 18 months ago, and we tried to make it look like there were lots of people there. It was the first thing we did after lockdown, and it was, uh, it was really a really important discussion about yeah. diversion it and was. the impact of reform, law reform. And uh, the one thing I'd say about tonight is that you've again encompassed a wide range of topics that are really centred on the humanity of our society. And I think if there's anything that I could say about you, you've been the most effective uh, independent member of parliament in my lifetime, and I am not young. <laughs> and uh, I think that needs to be acknowledged. But I think your, your clarity, your intelligence and your compassion mm. have been something that we all cherish and we acknowledge. You're a treasure of our state, Fiona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact. <laughs>